Ladies and gentlemen, coming up, we have a keynote discussion here, a keynote address here by the Honorable Mick Cornett, Mayor of Oklahoma City from the USA, and he's been Mayor of Oklahoma City since 2004. He's currently the longest serving mayor among the 50 largest cities in America, and one of his notable achievements is tackling a large problem. Now, if you have heard about how serious the obesity problem is in Oklahoma City, and how it was reshaped by addressing with some very innovative and creative strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Mick Cornett. Thank you very much. All right, quick, how many of you have ever been to Oklahoma City? Raise your hand. All right, All right. that was quite a few. Okay, um, you in the back, what would you think? If you couldn't hear him, he said it's the greatest city he's ever visited. And their mayor is fantastic. Thank you, sir, I agree with you. You have heard the saying, I'm sure, that Rome was not built in a day. In fact, around the world, cities of today had startings hundreds and thousands of years ago. And then there's Oklahoma City, because we were built in one day. It's a true story. In the 19th century, the United States was settling the western part of the country. And it was the old Wild West with cowboys and guns and cowboy hats. And they decided this one area where Oklahoma would someday be located would be settled in a single day. And they were going to give away free land. And so thousands of people came from all over the United States to this one particular point on between the railroad and the river. And they fired off a gun and these thousands of people roared across the countryside and they put a stake in the ground. And wherever they put that stake was their new home. The population of Oklahoma City went from zero to 10,000 in one day. Yeah. And our planning department is still paying for that. It's not a good idea to build a city in one day. Much better to spread it out over years or even centuries as it would be. The 20th century in the United States, of course, was about building roads to connect this vast land and all the American cities. And so highways were constructed. Oklahoma City was blessed. We had a city leader who went out to the road crews that were building these highways in the 1930s and he specifically tried to direct and instruct the road crews to make sure that every road led to Oklahoma City. And he was fairly successful. And today we have three large interstate highways that bring in hundreds of thousands of cars every day passing through our city. We had an economy that in many ways reflected commodities. We were an oil and gas community. We were on wheat. We were on cotton. And so when the price was up, our economy was very, very good. And when the price was down, our economy was very, very bad. In the 1980s, we were going through a rough patch, and the citizens elected a business-minded mayor named Ron Norick. And Ron Norick became a legendary mayor in Oklahoma City's history. We had allowed our downtown area to become almost void of, of, of people. Sure, people worked down there, but there were no restaurants or hotels. There really wasn't anything to do downtown. And we lost out on a big economic development opportunity, and Mayor Norick passed an initiative to rebuild downtown with sports arenas and libraries and transportation. He built a, a canal that would go through this old warehouse district, and we built an entertainment district with hotels and, and restaurants and a lot of entertainment opportunities. We built a new baseball stadium. We built a new sports arena. Mayor Norick even had the audacity to believe that we should put water in the river. 
Now, I bet many of you are thinking, what's the big deal about that? And that would be because your river had water. Our river did not have any water. It was just a big, dry ditch downtown, and the grown-ups called it the river, but growing up in that city, we didn't really understand why we would look in our geography books of all of the rivers of the world and had all of this rushing water going someplace. And in Oklahoma City, we had this big, dry ditch. In fact, the city of Oklahoma City had a line item in its budget to mow the river twice a year. It was that dry. The next mayor came along and did an incredible job rebuilding our schools. And then in the spring of 2004, in this rare act of collective misjudgment, the citizens elected me. Oh, man, that line has never gotten applause before. And so I become the mayor of this incredibly, seemingly robust city and follow two incredible predecessors. I mean, my predecessors had done a lot of the heavy lifting. They'd done a lot of the things. They'd taken care of a lot of the things that you need to do before a city can grow and become an economic power. And I sensed that my timing was really, really good because Oklahoma City started showing up on the lists. Now, the lists I'm talking about, because you know that websites and magazines, they love to rank cities, right? Yeah. Best city to do this, best city to do that. Well, we started showing up on all these lists, like best place to get a job, best place to start a business. Now, we weren't near the top on any of these lists at that point. We'd be like number 15 or number 18, but we were on a list. We'd never been on lists before. It was kind of fun to be on a list and to be compared to somebody. And then came the list of the most obese cities in the country. And there we were, number two. Well, I didn't know what to do about it. And of course, the media expected me to have answers. They would stick microphones in my face and ask me, what are you going to do about the list that says we're number two in obesity? And I'd say, I don't know. I didn't have any answers for that. And the problem was that I was using those lists to talk about all of the great things that I believed were about to happen in Oklahoma City. I was bragging about the economic development numbers, the new jobs, the, the entrepreneurial ways to start a business in Oklahoma City. I was the one that was using these lists to benefit Oklahoma City. And all of a sudden, these lists had come back to haunt me. And about that time, I got on the scales. And I weighed 218 pounds. So I went to this government website, and I typed in my height, and I typed in my weight, and I hit enter, and it said, obese. Oh, what a stupid website. I'm not obese. I would know if I was obese. And then I started getting honest about my lifelong struggles with obesity. And I realized that through the years, I had gotten into this pattern that I would gain about two or three pounds a year, and then about every 10 years, I'd take off 20 or 25 pounds. And as a result, I had this closet full of clothes that I could not wear. Well, maybe I could wear like a third of it, but only I knew which third of the closet was relevant for the weight that I was currently at. And it all seemed so normal while I was going through it. And then I realized I've become the obese mayor in the obese city. 
No one wants to be that person. And I knew I'd lost weight before, and I knew I could do it again, and so I just stopped eating as much. I was eating about 3,000 calories a day. I cut it to 2,000 calories a day. See, the problem is everybody wants to feed the mayor. Everywhere I would go, there would be food. People trying to be nice. Well, the mayor was eating. The mayor was eating too much. I'd been mayor about two years at that point, and I realized instead of gaining two or three pounds like I had been, I had gained 10 pounds a year in those first two years. And I realized if I was going to be mayor very long, I was going to be a really large mayor. So by cutting my calories down, the weight started coming off. And really, I was just trying to you know, live a little healthier life. I wanted to be a little thinner. And I started thinking, though, during this process, what is it about Oklahoma City that has kind of led so many people in our city to be overweight? Why us? And one day I figured it out. I realized we had built an incredible place if you happen to be a car. If you were an automobile, Oklahoma City was the best place around. Traffic moved swiftly through the city. No congestion. We had all of these fast food restaurants. In fact, I'm told that we're the fast food capital of the world with the most fast food restaurants per capita of any place around. Now, I don't know who counted them, but thank you very much for, for, for counting them up for me. And if you built something, if you built a house, you had to have all these garages for all of your cars. And if you built a, a, a school, the most dominant feature on the architectural plan of the school would be the automobile drop-off. Everything we did, everything we built was surrounding the car and our use of the automobile. Well, I lost the weight, and then I started thinking about obesity in Oklahoma City, and I thought one thing was peculiar. We weren't talking about it. I was thinking about it. I was looking around. I was trying to figure things out on it. But you'd think an issue that was that large that our city needed to confront, you would think there was this conversation that had penetrated the masses, but there was not. And so I started looking at that. And I realized, well, you know, we kind of think we're nice people. Nice people don't talk about, you know, things that, uh, well, about the way people look. You know, we had so many people that were overweight and being nice people, we don't want to talk negatively about people. So our kind of unannounced strategy to dealing with obesity was to ignore it and hope it goes away on its own. And that strategy had gotten us to number two in the country. Well, I finally decided I was going to do something about it. I didn't really know how we were going to lose weight, but I thought to myself, I know the first step has got to be a conversation. How do I get a conversation going? What can I do? What can I say to get people talking about obesity? And so on a December day in 2007, I went to our zoo, and I stood in front of the elephants, and I said, this city is going on a diet, and we're going to lose a million pounds. And that's when all hell broke loose. You see, the conversation that I had been wanting to get started all of a sudden took off. The media loved the story, and to the credit of the national media, they could have looked at this and said, that city was so fat, the mayor had to put everyone on a diet. But they didn't. They took the take of, this is a problem in a lot of places, 
And this is a city that's trying to do something about it. And so they helped promote it. I put together a website, and the address was thiscityisgoingonadiet.com. People logged on. They would put in their goal weight and what they weighed currently. And then as they lost weight, there was a counter on the website that would allow us to collect the amount of pounds that we had lost. So we knew how many people were involved and how many pounds were being lost. And immediately, the pounds started coming in. Thousands and thousands of people started getting involved and losing weight. When we'd been doing it three months, we'd already lost 250,000 pounds. And I held a press conference with our Air National Guard, sort of our military unit in kin to our Air Force. And I stood in front of two airplanes that weighed 125,000 pounds each to show the size of the amount of weight that Oklahoma City had already lost. And indeed, the weight continued, and we continued to work. And we would have press conferences and bring in people that had their lives changed. People that had lost over 100 pounds each were telling their stories. And of course, the media loves weight loss stories. And so the media kept it going. And I ran this entire program not using any tax dollars, no government, just me talking and this website that I had someone donate to the cause. Along the way, though, I started thinking, now that we've got this conversation going, what if we went back into this car-centric built environment and started redesigning our streets? You see, our streets were all designed for cars. Downtown, we had one-way streets, and they were like four and five lanes across. And here's what would happen. You would push the walk, don't walk sign, and it would finally say, walk. It's your turn, and you would start walking, and before you got like the third step, the light would start blinking, don't walk. And you would start walking faster, then you would start jogging, and then you would leap up on the curb just as the cars roared behind you. That was the culture we had creative. That's how friendly we were to pedestrians. We also had hundreds of thousands of houses in our suburban areas with absolutely no walkability, no sidewalks at all. We hadn't required developers to build sidewalks in many areas. Now, we had changed that, but the damage had already been done. And so we would built schools and neighborhoods, and we built shopping opportunities and neighborhoods, but we hadn't connected any of them with walkability. We had a simple theory. Why would you walk? You have a car. Everything we did was designed around having a car. So with this awareness campaign now taking hold, I went to the voters and we asked them to fund all of these infrastructure changes that we've been talking about. And it was a series of votes and there was some creative financing to get some of it done but with all of the efforts together, we have gone in and now built hundreds of miles of new sidewalks in Oklahoma City. We have constructed now over 100 miles of a jogging and biking trail system. Now, we had had the trail system for years, or at least had it on plans, but we never had any money to build it. With this proposal, we built the entire plan out so people could ride a bike so people could walk to the grocery store, they could walk to school, they could walk to the library and have a sidewalk to do so. We took all those one-way streets and we narrowed them, we made them two-way, we heavily landscaped them, we put on-street parking to, again to give the pedestrian a, a chance to have a more friendly environment. We built a huge park downtown, over 70 acres in size. It's under construction as we speak. We're building a downtown streetcar system, the largest streetcar system to launch in the United States, over four and a half miles. And again, it adds to that pedestrian-friendly experience. 
We're very serious about health. We're building senior health and wellness centers for people over 50. Our theory is this baby boom generation that I'm a part of is probably going to live and have wellness needs and health needs a lot longer than generations previously. We've got to get ahead of that. If we're going to create a city where people want to live, we're going to have to recognize that health is a growing, a larger concern. Well, in, in 2012, some four years and three weeks after the city went on a diet, we reached the million pounds. Yes. I know. And I had been in New York because the Rachel Ray television show, the talk show, wanted some of our more successful participants to come and be a part of a show. And while I was there, I did another round of, of media in New York. And I, I wound up in the lobby of Men's Fitness Magazine. And as I walked in, I remembered this was the magazine that had made us on that list of the most obese cities in the country four years earlier. And sure enough, by coincidence, as I sat down on the coffee table in the lobby was the current edition. And it said, America's fattest cities. Do you live in one? Well, I was pretty sure I did. So I picked up the magazine, and the way they do it, they take the 25 cities that are doing the best in the obesity category, and they put them on the list called the fittest cities. And then they take the 25 worst largest cities that are doing poorly, and they put them on the list calling them the fattest cities. And so I looked at the list of the fattest cities, and I couldn't find us. I was confused. So I slowly turned the page, and we were on the list of the fittest cities in the United States. I know. Uh, we were number 21 on the list of the fittest cities in the United States, but a far cry from where we had been four years earlier. Now, by now, I've been elected a lot of times. I'm in my fourth term, decided not to run a fifth term. And I've also pushed a lot of initiatives, and a lot of these initiatives we've paid to build all of this health infrastructure into our city. But to get any of these passed, or to get reelected, I have to have a vote of the people in my city. And I noticed there was this pattern. Year after year, when I would go in for reelection, I would wind up in some far-off neighborhood meeting in the suburbs, and I'd be pleading my case and talking about all the great elements of whatever it was I was trying to get people to vote for, whether it was me or, or some initiative that I was hoping to get them to vote for. And I, I could see in this pattern, there was usually at least one person who wasn't buying a thing that I said. No matter what I said, they had a frown on their face. And then I would take questions, and I knew whose hand was going to go up. And he would say something like this, Mayor, you're building a sidewalk in my neighborhood. And I could tell by his tone that he wasn't about to thank me. And I would say, really? I knew I didn't have to talk because I knew he would keep going. And he said, yes, we don't need a sidewalk. Nobody in our neighborhood walks. I thought, well, maybe they'd walk if you had sidewalks. He was going to think about that one for a while. And I could tell by his tone three things about this person. Doesn't like downtown. Doesn't like taxes. Doesn't like me. And when I've lost the arguments, when I've given him every bullet point that I've got, I usually close with this. I'd say, well, all I can tell you is we're creating a city where your kid and your grandkid are going to choose to live. Oh, they hate that argument. Because they know it's true. In the 1980s, when our 
economy was really struggling, my generation left Oklahoma City. And they left not because they necessarily wanted to leave, but we didn't have any jobs that measured up to a higher level of education. So if you had an advanced degree, there weren't jobs for you in Oklahoma City. And so people came here or to Dallas or to Houston or to Tokyo. They went a lot of places around the world to grow their families and to live a healthy and fitful life, but they left Oklahoma City. And now there's this feeling that young people want to stay. And it's documented by all the statistics. In fact, you might be surprised to know if you're aware much about the United States, there are more people from California moving to Oklahoma City than are going the other way. Thousands more. There are more people going from Texas to Oklahoma than are going the other way. Thousands more. And it really all gets back to what my predecessors learned. The secret to economic development is really creating a city where highly educated 20-somethings are going to choose to live. And we're attracting them over and over again, and especially now that we've adapted this health-centric lifestyle. All right, that's the speech. Let's look at some pictures. Ah, that's our old streets. Isn't that beautiful? Ah, uh, yeah. Look how pretty those streets are. Great architecture. You can really tell that we had a high quality of design back in the days. I mean, who wouldn't want to live in that city? Beautiful, beautiful streets. All right, then we started working on them. All right, so this begins the transformation. And here's what they started to look like. <clears throat> Same part of the city that you saw before, people actually walking. Our parks, skyscrapers being constructed, landscaping. Now, I mentioned with our, our initiative that my, one of my predecessors did, we took this old abandoned warehouse district. See these old brick buildings? Really not much good was going on inside these buildings. And they decided to build a canal down this street. That's the same street. Six million people a year visit what we call Bricktown. There's another picture of that same street. It's a mile long canal. Oh, remember the river? The river that didn't have any water? Well, it must have rained the night before this picture was taken, so there's a little bit of water at the top. And I, you probably can't see it, but that's a television set down at the bottom. <laughs> Somebody threw their television set into the ditch. Well, one of our initiatives, we built low-water dams, we impounded water, and today it's an Olympic training site. So the United States Olympic teams now train on our river that didn't have any water 15 years ago. We held the Olympic trials last spring, built boathouses. That's me pretending that I kayak. This is our whitewater facility. This is in downtown Oklahoma City. We built a man-made kayak facility that uh, the Olympic team trains on and it's adjacent to the river that now has water. And our citizens get to use it too, so it's not just for the, for the athletes. This is our senior wellness centers. The first one is open. 3,500 people have already signed up. They're going there to get healthier. And you can imagine the interaction that's now taking place. We took people that were sitting at home by themselves and got them out where they're corresponding and connecting with people. We think the mental illness aspect of it alone will benefit our citizens. That's me at the first groundbreaking. Our second one is under construction. We're building a new convention center, $280 million. You see our street in front of the convention center. And we just started construction on a 70-acre park. And so this is me at the groundbreaking. This is just a few months ago. And the kids came out, and we've called the park Scissor Tail Park. The kids 
had a tough time spelling scissor tail. But nonetheless, we got the, the park under construction. You see how close it is to downtown. There's an aerial view of the, what the artists tell us it will look like. Part of the park. I always like the fact that when architects draw parks, everybody's thin. <laughs> look at all those thin people. We all look like fashion models in Oklahoma City now. We're building a streetcar system. There you see the modern streetcar. We just built a new building out at the fairgrounds. This is one of our trail systems. See the hundreds of miles of bike trails that are being constructed. That's me on the lead bike. I assure you the other riders held back so that I could break the tape as we went across. And we're building sidewalks throughout the city. Hundreds and hundreds of miles of sidewalks. And that's our story. Thank you all very much. I've enjoyed my stay here, and you've been a great audience. Thank you.